You are listening to the Invitation Church podcast. To learn more about Invitation Church, visit us online at invitation605.com. You can also download our app on iTunes and Google Play by searching for Invitation 605. So how is everybody doing tonight? Doing good? Good to see every one of you. It's crazy to think, I gotta say, God works in some very mysterious ways sometimes to think that in 16 months, my wife and I moved away from Sioux Falls, bought a house, sold a house, and moved back to Sioux Falls in 16 months is just absolutely crazy. And it's so cool just to think about the way God has been so faithful to Anna and I. Um, and just the conversations that Dave and I were having like 10 months ago, guys, it's crazy. Like 10 months ago, Dave and I started the conversation of what would it look like to have everything redirected back and Ann and I end up here. And it, I just want to make a point of that because I think it's cool to think about how sometimes it just like takes a lot of time for God to work. Like he is working in slow ways sometimes. I think we oftentimes think, oh, it'd be great to God for God just to hurry this all up. And I know that was um, true of me for a while. And Dave always had to remind me, hey man, like we're in no hurry. God works in slow, mysterious ways. And so um, Anna and I are so grateful to be here and a part of Invitation Church and the community here. Um, I just want to give a shout out. If you helped us unload our tr- moving truck, like literally a month ago to this day, thank you so much. There is um, several people in this room that came over and unloaded our U-Haul truck. Uh, Kendall, I'm still waiting on our living room floor plans. We're still trying to figure out how that all gets put together. So if you want to just let us know after the service, that'd be great. So if you know, you know, right, Kendall? Your, your wheels are still spinning. Mine too, totally. Uh, well, hey, I just want to start uh, tonight by asking a question. Is there anybody in this room that's willing to admit that they get frustrated really easily? I'm not talking about just like, you know, a little frustration. I'm talking about frustration to the point where like it in affects your entire day. Anyone willing to admit it? A few people. Okay, awesome. I love that we're honest people in the house of God. Well, I am one of those people Wow, I'm sad to say, like, things just frustrate me very quickly. And I actually put together a list of some frustrating situations that I have found myself in recently. Um, and I thought I would do this just to help you understand me better as a person as well. And so one of those things that really frustrates me is change of plans. Now, I want to be specific. Like, I'm not talking about when people change plans on me. I get really frustrated when, like, I have to change plans on other people. So like if I give somebody my word that, hey, I'm going to be here at this time, at this date, and then it doesn't happen, I get so frustrated. You can ask my wife that. It's just something that's that's just who I am. Another thing that really frustrates me um, is watching a movie with subtitles on. Is there anybody that agrees? Like I have a brother that when I go over to his house, every single movie that we watch, it always has to be with subtitles on. And I'm like, Tyson, dude, I do not need to know that there is like dramatically suspenseful music playing in the background. I'm like, dude, just let me watch the movie, okay? Like, just let it all unfold. Another frustrating thing for me, I'm a big diehard Las Vegas Raiders fan, and I know there's a whole lot of Chiefs fans in this uh, church. So it's so frustrating when the Raiders can never beat the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm like, dude, seriously, once in a while, can can the Raiders ever win, please? I know the Seek brothers aren't here, but that's all right. Uh, Another thing that frustrates me is when I go to Starbucks, I order a cup of coffee, specifically a caramel macchiato, because that's just my drink. And it's really frustrating when the barista only fills my cup half full of coffee, and then like the rest with whipped cream. I'm like, I pay six bucks for that cup of coffee, and you're going to only fill it half full? Frustrating. Anyone else like experience that a little bit? So frustrating. The last thing I put on my list Uh, It has to do with my wife, and I just got to be careful here, but something that really frustrates me about my wife is when she thinks, like, the passenger side of my vehicle is a trash can. I'm like, honey, it takes as much effort to throw the trash on the floor as it does to put it in the trash can, and I think I was able to get a picture of of my car. This is what my car usually looks like after my wife rides in it. But I'm just kidding. Not that bad. But these are physical representations of frustration. But what about like spiritual frustration? Because I think that is a real thing as well. Like being spiritually frustrated. Some examples are like, man, when you ask God over and over again to heal your family member, 
and he chooses not to. Man, that's spiritually frustrating. Or, you at, or God is asking you to do something that like you don't really want to do. It's really uncomfortable, but he keeps asking you to do it. Man, that's frustrating at times. Or God having you in a, se- a season much longer than you want to be in. Oh man, I feel like that was my story recently. I'm like, Lord, just hurry this up. Like, I just, this is so frustrating, but God's like, just be patient. Here's the thing about frustration that I feel like I've learned is that frustration, I think, teaches us to only think about ourselves, to only view, like to to put our sights only on ourselves and how we're feeling, what's going on inside of us. We kind of get like tunnel vision walking through our day and we only think about ourselves. But tonight I want to actually challenge us a little bit just to think about our frustrations in a different way. And so my question that I want us to think about as we begin is this, what if God is allowing frustration to happen in your life to show you something beautiful. Like, what if God is allowing frustration in your life to show you something so beautiful? Like, I want to acknowledge, though, like, that there's tension in frustration and beauty. Like, having that in the same sentence. The, the title of my message is Finding Beauty in Your Frustration. Finding Beauty in Your Frustration. Like, there's so much tension in that statement, like finding beauty in frustration. Like I'm a person where I'm like, okay, Lord, if I'm going to experience frustration, like just give me, just give me frustration. But like, don't be bouncing back and forth between like frustrating situations and then also something beautiful and then something more frustrating and then something beautiful. I'm like, give me one or the other, but not back and forth. Well, as we dive into our text in Acts 16, I believe this is the tension that Paul and Silas are wrestling with as they are about to go out on their second missionary journey. This tension of being able to find something beautiful in the midst of some very frustrating situations. And so I want to take us on a journey tonight and quickly highlight just four different frustrating situations that Paul and Silas had to encounter in the midst of trying to be obedient to what God ask them to do. But I want to just make a point. I think we got to remember that like these are real people. Paul, Silas, the, the, the people we're talking about tonight, they were real people, meaning they had real emotions, things that they struggled with in the midst of trying to be obedient to God. I think it's easy to read scripture and go, oh, these made, like, made up stories, made, made up characters. No, these were real people with real emotions. And so as we jump in, just to give you some context of where we're at, I thought Deep did an amazing job last week talking about Acts 15, where he said, if you're going to clothe your life with anything, clothe it with grace. Wrap your life with grace. And at the end of Acts 15, we have Paul and a man named Barnabas about to go out on this second missionary journey. So they're about to go out and share the gospel, and they want to interact with churches and other believers that they had already talk to prior. So like the whole motive behind this missionary journey was to do kind of like a check-in. Like they wanted to check in with some church, new church plants and check in with some believers that they had already had conversation with who've responded to the gospel. So Paul and Barnabas are about to go out and then you maybe have heard this passage of scripture where Paul and Barnabas have this disagreement where they butt heads. Where Barnabas Barnabas is like, great, let's go out. I'm going to, let's take this guy named John Mark. And then uh, Paul says, hey, that's not a good idea. We're going to take a man named Silas. And they couldn't agree on what to do. They butted heads. Eventually, they just parted ways. And so Paul and now a man named Silas are about to head out on their second missionary journey. And this is where we're going to pick up in our text in Acts 16. So the first situation that actually Paul and Silas run into is very quickly at the beginning of their journey. I want to throw up this passage of scripture here. Frustration number one is the Holy Spirit. Acts 16, verse 6 through 7, it says this. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to enter. Like what is, what? The spirit of God would not allow them to enter. 
I want to actually give us a quick map. I'm a visual person, so I like to see, like visualize what is going on in the biblical text so we can get a better idea. And so I'm going to stand up to the side so I don't block some people here. So as you can see this Antioch here, this is where Paul and Barnabas have that disagreement where they part ways with each other. And you can see these arrows going all the way around. This is Paul's second missionary journey. It took three years and they traveled 2,700 miles by foot or potentially by boat as well, obviously, once you hit water. But I'm like, 2,700 miles? I don't think I can even walk that in a lifetime. And so where this passage of scripture happens at where we just read, so they, Paul and Silas leave Antioch. They get to a place called Derby. They pick up a man named Timothy. We don't have time to talk about that. But they get to this province here of Asia, and this Holy Spirit prevents them from preaching the gospel there. And then they try again up here in Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit prevents them from teaching the word and preaching the word in two different places. Like, how frustrating would have that been if you were Paul? Like, they're going out on this journey, and I imagine, you know, they're super pumped. They have a lot of excitement. They have a lot of energy. Like, man, let's go out. Let's see who's going to respond to the gospel this time. I can't wait to check in with all these churches. And then two times the Spirit says, nope, you're not there, and nope, not there. If I was Paul, I'd be sitting back, scratching my head, going, God, what is going on? Like, what? What are you doing? Like, it's not a bad thing for people to hear the gospel. I think we can all agree about, upon that. Or it reminds me of a, of a Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 9, when it says this, A man's mind plans his ways as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. And I think that's what God is doing in the midst of Paul's journey here. Is like, oftentimes we have a plan and we think this is the way it's going to go, and so we're walking, and we're going this way, and then God intervenes and redirects our steps in a line with his purpose and will for our life. But we aren't really clued in on a whole lot of detail, though. Like, I always wonder, how did the Spirit of God prevent them from going to these places? Scripture never says. It never gives us detail. Like, did the Spirit literally, like, shut their mouth? to the point like where they walked into these provinces and then it was like, mm, 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 like they couldn't say anything? Or like did the spirit put up like this invisible wall so when they tried to walk in, they hit it and then, you know, tried to go around it and they just couldn't? Or like did the spirit like kick them in the shins and they crippled them and they couldn't walk to these places? We don't know. But I don't know about you, but when the Lord usually tries to get my attention, he does it through what I call spiritual feelings spiritual feelings. And I just want to preach into this just for a little bit because I'm passionate about helping people gain a healthy perspective when it comes to their feelings and what the Lord is doing inside of them and responding to the Spirit's voice in their life. I think the worst advice I potentially have ever been given along my spiritual journey is, Jada, never trust your feelings. Like, I've had many people tell me that. Even this last season I was in, like, Jada, never trust your feelings. Like, your feelings, nope, they're, they're a roller coaster. Never trust your feelings. Like, I want to say, I 100% believe that your feelings can and will be misleading at times. For sure, 100% believe that. But I also 100% believe that when God wants to get your attention, he will sometimes do it through your feelings. Like, when God is trying to get my attention, I usually have a whole lot of spiritual discontentment inside of me. We're like, I can't sleep. I'm restless. There's a deep discomfort in my gut. And like, I have that feeling constantly, consistently over the course of many days. So to say, just never trust your feelings. I I can't disregard those if God is trying to get my attention. And so a a way that I've thought about and tried to start viewing feelings when it comes to kind of my spiritual journey with Jesus, I think this was a a healthy way that someone told me about one point, and I want to share it with you. But I think we should view our feelings sometimes like warning lights on a car. And what I mean by that is this, is oftentimes, like when you're driving your vehicle, you know those warning lights that come up on your dashboard? They come on, and it alerts you that potentially something could be wrong underneath the hood. That like it needs some checking out to do. Like so, when the warning lights comes on, I take my vehicle in, and usually one of two things happens. One, when they check it out, the guy might come back to me and say, hey, no big deal. It was a faulty light switch for some reason, came down, you're good, you can get back out on the road. 
But then other times the person responds and says, hey, Jaden, yeah, man, you should have probably like changed your oil 20,000 miles ago. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. That's a great idea. Well, I think this is the way that we should start viewing our feelings. That like when something is going on inside of us, when the Lord is trying to get our attention, sometimes it is best to just pump the brakes a little bit and get your feelings checked out. Like to have a conversation with, with a close friend, a mentor saying, hey, I'm kind of feeling this way. Do you think that, you know, this, this could be something? Like I feel like the Lord has put this on my heart. Do you think that would potentially be a good thing? Like have a conversation. Sometimes your feelings could just be your body responding to just certain situations in life. That could happen for sure. But also sometimes it could be the Lord is trying to give you some feelings and emotions to get you to listen and respond to what he's asking you to do. And this is what I tend to believe potentially could have happened with Paul and Silas and Timothy. Like something happened, whether internally, externally, that alerted them not to go to these places like Asia and Bithynia to preach the gospel. But even though it wasn't bad, like it could have potentially been what was, that was not what was best for Paul and Silas. So that's frustration number one. Then we get to frustration number two, the vision, the vision. Acts 16, verses nine through 10. And so Paul and Silas are told, don't go here, don't go here. So what are they supposed to do? Now what? Well, then interesting, very, a couple of verses later, Paul gets a vision and the vision says this, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. Like, this vision is super clear, it's very short, but it's an entire change to Paul's plans. Like the vision is, hey, Paul, go to Macedonia. There's a man there that needs your help. Clear and short. But it's an entire change of plans. Because we got to remember that like the whole motive and goal for Paul going out on this journey was they were just going to have these like check-ins with churches and, and believers in the area. And then all of a sudden God throws this vision on him and says, hey, no, Paul, there is specifically a man in Macedonia that needs your help. So I would say that this mission now has turned from a maintenance mission into a rescue mission. There's something specific for you, Paul. You got to get going. But if I was like Paul, I would probably be super annoyed at this point. Like, God, this wasn't a part of my plan. Like, I was just going to do some check-ins with some churches and, like, have some conversations and maybe preach the gospel. But now you want me to go to Macedonia. I want to go back to this map. here we go. Here's where Paul gets this vision, and he tells him, I want you to go way farther west. I mean, this is a long distance farther west for Paul to go. Like, can anyone relate to maybe this feeling of frustration that oftentimes, like, we have a set plan in place telling God how we think our future potentially should go. Like, we say, here, God, this would be a great job for me. This would be a great house for our family. This would potentially be, like, a great environment for us to be in. And then when God doesn't pull through, sometimes it is so frustrating when he tells us, no, we're going to do something different. I got something specific for you. When God's plan doesn't match ours, we get very frustrated. And so just a quick story for you about something that I felt like just happened in my life where I can resonate so much with what is happening in the midst of this journey. Well, back in 2022, when my wife and I were kind of in this season of discernment, of like what was next for our family, where the Lord wanted us, and we felt like the Lord was pointing us signs to Minnesota. And so I actually applied at a church up in Minnesota. It was a decently large church that was like making a really big impact in the Minneapolis area. And there was a youth pastor position open, and I thought, man, this would be a really cool fit for us. And so I applied, and I continually told Anna through the interview process, I said, honey, I think like if I get offered this job, I'm for sure gonna take this, because I think this is a great opportunity. And so, like, we went through the whole interview process. I tell you what, it was the most extensive interview process I've ever been a part of. There was, like, six rounds of, like, two hours worth of questions where you sat in a room and they literally just asked you question after question after question after question. And I'm just trying to answer these questions the best I could. And we get all the way to the end of the interview process 
and I was one of the remaining candidates, I said, honey, I, f- I still feel really good about this. And so they give us a deadline on, okay, we'll get back to you on this date. And so we're sitting and we're praying and we're waiting. The deadline comes, we hear nothing. And I'm like getting frustrated, what's going on? So about a week goes by, nothing. About two weeks go by, then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pick up the phone and call. I don't wanna be that guy though that's like pressuring them, hey, you should choose me, you know? And so I call, you know, pick up the phone and I call this individual that was interviewing us and I said, hey, you know, just wanna check in to see what's going on. And he said, oh yeah, shoot, we forgot to kind of get back to you. And then I had the conversation and kind of got that phone call where he said, hey, you know what, actually we decided like we're not gonna move forward with you. And like hearing those words, like, it was so frustrating. Like, even to the point where I was so angry. Like, literally for probably about a month, I was so frustrated and angry. And then I find out, like, they actually, it wasn't like I didn't get hired because they hired someone else. They just didn't hire anyone. So I'm like, man, I couldn't even beat, like, any, like, nobody? It was so weird. And so then it was kind of funny, though. Fast forward, my, when my wife and I actually do move up to Minnesota, I ended up getting a different ministry job. And when we're up there, we actually started attending this church on the weekends, on like their Saturday night services. And it was crazy. Like the more we were there, the more involved we got, like I started to see some things that I was just like, hmm, that's like an interesting way to do it. Like totally, maybe not like how I potentially would do it. And then like I started seeing some other structure stuff that I'm like, shoot, I don't know if that like fits me very well. And what I realized in that moment was like, I was sitting there being so angry and frustrated at the Lord. And then I could now flip my frustration and anger and start actually being appreciative and grateful that I actually didn't get the job because I think it was the Lord's way of like protecting me. Not that this would have been a place that was like gonna cause physical or spiritual harm, but I think it potentially maybe just wasn't the best fit for me. And it was the Lord's way of keeping me on his path for my life. Now, I ran across this quote by um, Chuck Swindle. I thought this was so great and totally applied to what I was feeling. Chuck Swindle says, before the Lord can turn us, he oftentimes, he has to stop us first. Like, I think that's what the Lord was doing to me. And I think that's what the Lord was doing to Paul in this moment. Like when he gets his vision, first he stops him from going to different places, gives him a vision so he could turn Paul and get him going towards a place that he needed him. And it shows a lot about Paul's heart, though, is that scripture says, like, they responded immediately. He got the vision and at once went to Macedonia. That even when it didn't match his plan, Paul's plan that he originally had, he was still obedient to what God asked of him. That's frustration number two. Number three, frustration number three, the annoying spirit, Acts 16, verses 16 through 18. So I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit here. Paul and Silas end up, Getting to Macedonia, they settle in the city called Philippi. And the very first individual that Paul and Silas run into, you would think would be like a man, right? Oh, a man in Macedonia. They run into him right away and he's saved and all is good. No, he actually runs into a, a woman, a woman named Lydia. And scripture says Lydia was a dealer. Now, let me specify, not the dealer you're probably thinking about. She was a dealer of pur- a purple cloth, meaning she was probably extremely wealthy and very successful and well-known in that area. Paul preaches, and Lydia is one of the first people in Philippi to probably respond to the gospel at this point. Her and her entire household get saved and baptized because of it. And so right after that, we get to verse 16, and it says this. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and, Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so what? Okay, come on, let's do, we'll try it again. Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit in the name of of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left, left her. Like this, this stuff kept happening every single day where this woman was following Paul and Silas everywhere they went. Scripture says daily this happened. This wasn't a one-time thing. Daily, 
This woman is like in their shadows following them. These, these men are servants of the Most High God. These men are servants of the Most High God. Over and over again. Finally, Paul gets so annoyed, he turns around, casts his demon out of her. This word annoyed in the Greek can be translated as to be troubled, to be displeased, to be even offended, to be worked up. So Paul gets so worked up that he cast his demon out of this woman just so she could be quiet. Like, I'm wondering though, like, is he annoyed because of the demon shouting at him nonstop? Or is this almost one of those moments where like Paul's frustration has kind of come to a boiling point? Like because of frustration after frustration after frustration, he's so annoyed that he just takes it out on this demon. I wonder, we don't know. But what I love about this part of Paul's journey is that even though he was worked up and he still hadn't found the man in Macedonia that needed help, like kingdom work was still happening. Like Lydia and her entire household got saved. A demon-possessed girl was freed from her bondage, and now the gospel is starting to expand to brand, ex, to, expand to brand new places. I think it's important to remember that like, even though it didn't feel like or look like the vision that God specifically gave Paul, Ministry work could still happen. You may be thinking, well, how does this apply to us? Well, oftentimes, I think like when we are in a season of life, when we feel like, like we're annoyed, we're frustrated, like something's going on inside of us, we're like, man, this doesn't really seem right. Like I'm, maybe I'm in the wrong season. Maybe I'm in the wrong job. Like maybe, man, God's probably got something else. Like we're so quick to change the season because of our frustration. But I tend to believe that Like, your frustration doesn't necessarily mean you're in the wrong place. I believe that sometimes your frustration might mean that there's just still kingdom work that can be done around you. That's frustration number three. And then we get to frustration number four, which is the prison cell. And I can invite the band to come up if you would like, and we can, I'm going to try to land the plane here on number four. Has anyone ever been in a season of life where it's almost like, man, you just can't seem to do anything right? Like, no matter what you do, you just can't do, can't do, seem to do it right. Like, oftentimes the phrase, when it rains, it pours. There we go. Gets pinned to some of those things. When it rains, it pours. I can't just do, I see, can't seem to do anything right. Well, I think that's potentially where Paul could have been at at this point in his missionary journey. He can't just, he see, can't seem to do anything right. So Paul sets his demon-possessed girl free, casts his demon out, and what happens? I'll par- paraphrase a little bit for you again, too. Well, the thing was that I don't think Paul and Silas realized was this lady was actually owned by somebody else, and these people were making money off of this lady because there was a spirit that said that she could tell fortunes of the future, and so people would pay this lady money to get a fortune of the future. And so these people were making money off this woman. When Paul casts this demon out, these people are so mad they can't make money off of this lady anymore. And so what do they do? They arrest Paul. They take him to the authorities. He's beaten with rods and he's thrown into prison. All because they were trying to be obedient to God. Like frustration after frustration after frustration. Like, here's Paul in prison. Like, I wonder if potentially this was like Paul's rock bottom moment. Whereas he's like sitting on his knees in the jail cell, just going like, God, why? Like, I had every pure intent and desire to please you and to serve you, and it leads me here? And I just wonder, man, is there maybe anyone in this room that could potentially relate to the feeling that Paul could be having of being in rock bottom, like frustration after frustration after frustration. Like, I just can't seem to do anything right. Like, you feel like you you hit rock bottom. And it's maybe not because of something you've done. Maybe it's just because of what's been done around you or to you, and then here you are in rock bottom's basement. Frustration after frustration after frustration. I love Paul and Silas' response to where they're at in the jail cell. Verse 25, this is where I want to pick up. It says this. 
Well, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What? Let me read that again. Paul, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's not my response, just being honest. I would not be praising and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Like, they're praying and worshiping in the midst of being in prison. Like, I think Paul's appropriate response, if there was any point where Paul could have complained, I think it would have been right now. Like, I think he could have been in the jail cell going, God, why? Why? Why me? Seriously, God, I'm just trying to preach and all these roadblocks keep getting put up. Like, he might be thinking, you know what, ministry is hard the way it is, but when you get punished for doing something good, I'm a help. Like, that's my breakthrough point. Those could have been his responses. But we don't find them doing that at all. They're worshiping and praying to God. And, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and preach this gospel that I'm going to say, hey, just, just keep worshiping, right? Keep praying. Your chains are going to break off and you're going to come out of your prison cell, whatever you're dealing with. You know, I don't tend to believe it works that way for everyone because I know people and have close friends who, no matter how much they prayed and worship, the chains just haven't fallen off yet for them. They haven't had this breakthrough moment, no matter how much they prayed. But I do think that something happens, like when you choose to respond to your frustration with praise and worship and prayer, like I think something happens within your soul when you decide to worship and pray in the midst of your biggest frustrations in your life. Like worship helps us put our soul in a posture of hope of faith, of expectancy, joy, which is what you might need in the midst of your biggest frustrations. Expecting that even though it's so frustrating, God has not done work. Like he could change your season. He could change your situation. That's what worship does to our souls. You might be thinking, okay, awesome, Jaden, but I'm still having a hard time connecting the dots. The title of your message was Finding Beauty in Your Frustration. Where's the beauty? Well, this is where I get so excited. This is the stuff that I'm so passionate about. Verse 27, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his swords and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. The cool part is, the rest of the story is they do get saved. This jailer, his entire household, they get saved and they all get baptized that night. But I think it goes much deeper than a prison guard getting saved that night. Because I have to remind you, we need to go back to the beginning of the vision Paul was given. A man in Macedonia needing his help. Could this be Paul's, the, the man in Paul's vision? I don't know. Scripture never says. But I tend to believe it is. Because here is Paul, though in prison, he's standing before a man who's in Macedonia and he needs a whole lot of help. Not physical help, but spiritual help. And if it was him, that means we can look back on the entire chapter 16 as a whole and begin to see how beautifully planned out every single thing was by God. Like, listen, if the Spirit had not prevented Paul from preaching the gospel in Asia, he would have never gotten the vision that changed his entire plans. And if Paul had never gotten the vision about a man in Macedonia, he would have never gone and met the demon-possessed girl. If he never met the demon-possessed girl, he wouldn't have cast this demon out, which got him in trouble. If he was never in trouble, he would have never got thrown in prison. If he was never in prison, he would have never met the man in Macedonia who needed a whole lot of help. How beautifully planned out all of this was by God. And I think it's easy to look at our frustration and go, there's no purpose. Like, I'm in the wrong season, I gotta get out. 
Like if Paul thought that and walked away right away, think of everything he would have missed out on. So that's Paul's story. But my question is, what about your story? Like where do you find yourself today? More specifically, what is frustrating you right now? Like I want you to visualize, maybe if you need to close your eyes, like visualize what is the phase in your life that is frustrating you every single day you wake up. Like whether it's a person, whether it's something that's been done to you, whether it's a place you're in, a season of life, a job, what's frustrating you? If I had to take a guess, I think like you and your family potentially maybe have been approached with a whole lot of frustration in the last several years. Like when I look back and I dare, dare to say the name pandemic, <laughs> but when we've come through the pandemic and just what's going on in our culture with political tension, all this stuff happening in, our, in the world, I wonder, my guess is there's probably some frustration that you and your family find yourself in. I know for me, if I could be brutally honest, this last year has been... This last year to two years has probably been one of the most frustrating seasons of my entire life. (laughs) Things that are outside of my control of times when I'm standing yelling at God, raising my fists in the air at God, what are you doing? And if you can relate to any of that, my closing question that I want to ask you, again, begin to think about our frustrations differently. is what if God is trying to use your frustrations to get you into the exact place you need to be so that he can do something significant through you? Like, that's what he did with Paul. Like, God might be saying to you, like, I know, child, it's so frustrating. I know what they've done to you. I know where you're at. I know what you're feeling. But, like, I need you there. Like, I need you to hold on a little bit longer. I need you there because there's something specific and beautiful that I want to do in you, through you, potentially around you. You don't ever know what it is, but God is working. I've learned the longer you stand in the frustration, the better chance you have at being able to turn around and look back going, man, there was beauty all over my frustration. I potentially missed it. I wonder how much beauty I missed because of my frustration. So there is beauty in the midst of your frustration. Will we stay in it long enough to see it? I think that's what God wants to know. Like, are you willing to stay in it? Are you willing to, to, not to run from it so quickly, but stay in it like Paul did? When one frustrating thing happens, it's okay. Take a step forward. Keep following him. Be willing to to stay in the frustration so that your beauty, you will see it all over the place. I'm going to pray for us. And the band's going to close with a song. God, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for every person in this room. God, their stories, their lives, wherever they find themselves, God, I, I assume and can guess that there is some frustration that people are approached with in their life. And God, would you grow us, give us strength, patience, to not be so quick to run from frustration, but be willing to stay in it because there might be something that you are wanting to do, something beautiful in us or through us or around us because of our frustration. God, we love you. We praise you. And we give you all the praise and glory. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Invitation Church podcast. I want to encourage you to take the message that you just heard and receive every part of it. Every promise from God, every declaration of his great love for you, every word of hope, every reminder that you have been made for more. Allow what you've heard to take root in your soul to allow Jesus to do the deep work that only he can do. I also want to encourage you to be part of what we are doing here at Invitation as we invite people to live the way of Jesus. Go to the app and become a regular giver, an investor in the story that God is writing in this place. Also, if you found the message meaningful, we'd love to have you share it with someone else as you partner with us in carrying the message beyond the walls of the church. I want to thank you for being here with us. Grace and peace.